Right. So that's a, that's an exceptional specimen. And this is a very small one. Uh, there's enough there you can tell it's a meteor asteroid. It's maybe a little disarticulated, so you can't really see all the features. And it's also very small. That, um, these two here are from uh, the Richmond over in Indiana. Okay. This is, uh, this is the site that um, we were talking about here. Back in, apparently in the 88, people were excited about finding <coughs> asteroids, kind of like they were excited about trilobites. And people were asking Steve Felton, who knows where to find everything here, where do we find these, where do we find these? So Steve gave us a program one night and uh, explained you know, where they are, where you find them stratigraphically, and then actually gave us specific instructions or directions on how to find a site in Florence in the industrial parks where they found either is. Everybody wrote everything down, including me. I couldn't go the next day for some reason. But I went Sunday, you know, that two days later. And I must not have written it down right, because I never did find the site that Steve was talking about uh, until I got the directions clarified at the next meeting. But Steve had also said that any place in the Florence Industrial Parks was fair game for uh, Idra asteroids. So I went off one of these side roads and started looking around, and I found this, uh, this lot here which is all graded off for uh, future construction. Of course, this is the current picture, and nobody's constructed on it yet. Uh, and I started wandering around on that. This is all this big flat area that goes off here to the right. Lots of raffles skin laying on top of the ground, clean as a whistle, nothing on them, not even a bride's own. So I wandered back this way, and when you get to here, the ground kind of tapers off down toward a drainage area, a little stream. And when I crested this little, little tiny hill here, I look down and here's uh, a specimen that's like, whoa, this has got something on it. I get down and look, it's an eater asteroid. So in the course of a half an hour, I picked up about a dozen specimens just laying out on the ground over here. Um, got my friend Steve, <coughs> who's a, the guy who taught me how to collect. And we came down the next weekend, and he, he recognized something that uh, was common to some of the specimens. And when you get up later, you'll see I've got some of the little slabs up here one of the commonalities is the way those slabs look on the edges. It's not like you took one and just broke it it's nice and sharp. It's, it's, it's eroded on the sides, very distinctive looking. So we thought, well, let's find that. So we found this layer. And the layer was eroding out right about in that area. So we had the fever. We started digging, I think, all summer. We'd come down every weekend, spend an entire day here <coughs> digging uh, this pavement out as best we could. Tell well, we quit. When the, when the ground got deeper than that to dig, we kind of gave up, basically. Uh, there is still plenty of pavement there, I'm certain, but you would need to dig about six feet. And that's not really my area, that's Dan's area. <laughs> um, after doing this shallow digging, I have great respect for people like Dan and Don that do this kind of stuff uh, a lot, because uh, it's not something I want to do for a living, let me tell you. This was an interesting site. I say we were down here all summer. I'll tell you that, and you can probably tell, this is one of those big power towers, high tension wire towers. When it's humid out, and you're here, it sounds like frying bacon. Everything but the smell. It's very, very interesting. And um, one of our collecting trips, we again, we had the fever, so we were going to go down here no matter what. Weather forecaster, acne weather, just like we got now, man. We got great weather forecasts. Said uh, scattered showers. No big deal. No big deal. You go down. Well, the scattered showers turned out to be scattered thunder showers, not just little showers. <clears throat> we got hit by three of them. And during the first two, we questioned the, the, the intelligence of digging in the rain in a thunderstorm underneath these wires. <laughs> and we thought, well, you know, if lightning happened, it would hit the wires. You know. Wouldn't get, it wouldn't hurt us or anything, so we kept digging. And one of the other things that we found out is that when you're digging a pit and it's in a drainage area and it rains, the pit gets full of water. <laughs> the second thing we found out was shovels don't make very good bailing buckets. <laughs> I mean, we were down maybe a foot, you could still dig a little trench and kind of drain out. But once you got below that, you were in trouble. Uh, we also learned that when you dig this stuff out in the rain and it's wet, 
and you get the shovel in it, it's shoveling pretty good. But when you go like this, it doesn't go. It stays on the shovel. <laughs> so it was extremely difficult that day. But we did eventually get our little uh, booty out of there. Um, when the third thunderstorm hit, again, we were still still at it. And I was, I was over in this area, and Stu was out here somewhere. And I happened to look up over towards Stu. And as I did, at the top of my sight, you know, these wires. And there's a huge fireball on the wire. It scared me to death. I said, Stu, I'm going in the car. <laughs> so I waited that one out in the car. At this time uh, in, in my history, I had a uh, kind of an original VW bus, rubber floor mats, vinyl seats, and all that. You know, great thing for this, great thing. And you go back to the car, the cars were parked way down, you know, back here to the right off the picture, kind of near underneath those wires. Even in the dry weather, when you open the car door, you get shocked when you touch the car door. Um, but anyway, that day, after taking all that stuff out and loading the car up going home, by the time we got back to uh, Dayton, where, I was, where we were, I was living at the time, we got out of the car, the, the vinyl seats had an inch of water in them, draining out of our clothes. It was, it was, a, it was a neat, unique experience. <laughs> so now, here's a, here's a drier day. This is, uh, Stu was more adventurous than I. We had kind of dug kind of the easy stuff, thought we knew where you know, the layer was, and he was going to see you know, where, how far out it went. Unfortunately, it was, wasn't this far. Uh, but he was determined to, to keep going at it. Uh, this is the methods uh, that you have to use to dig. Notice the shovel. He broke his shovel, trying to dig this hole. And here he is examining a slab, and what he's seeing there is one, it's big. The slabs for our layer were not big. It also has nice straight sides, um, so that was a that was a tip, and uh, also the fact that you can find the heat on it. And you can see they were really big and really heavy. <coughs> Here at the end of the day, he's trying to clean some of them off. We, he took it all home. It's in a kind of a sidewalk at this point <laughs> because there really wasn't anything on it. And uh, this is just something else we did. We we filled in the uh, the holes when we left. No, I, I had better luck because, again, I wasn't that adventurous to try to go far afield. And uh, I moved up this, this little drainage ditch here. And uh, by the time I got down, I think whatever this is, 18 inches or 20 or 24, whatever that is, is when you get to the, the actual layer, that we like to call it, for the for the EGS. Here's a little better look. One thing I, I'll point out, and it's, it's really not uh, something you can appreciate in the slide, is this thing called the sandy layer. We would hit, we call it that. When we'd uh, get down to that, between one and two inches below that was the heat rail layer. That always came first. If you didn't get that, you weren't going to get any heat rails. I don't know what this was. It wasn't really consolidated. It was gritty, you know, maybe little bitty pieces uh, might have been fused together. But it was always there above those uh, heat rails. And uh, if you can appreciate the slab size, you can see the joints here. They're not, they're not huge like the things that Stu was uh, working working on the other the other pit. And here's all the stuff I pulled out of that and I'm trying to backfill. Now, now I didn't break my shovel too. That's that's Stu's. I gave him the, the one with a good handle. At this point I couldn't shovel anything anymore. Uh, I ended up sitting up here pushing this stuff down in that hole with my feet. I was worn out. So like I say I appreciate what Dan and Don do all the time. Uh, but prior to this, Stu and I were uh, dyed the wool surface collectors. And we kind of decided as long as you weren't throwing dirt over your shoulder that uh, it was still surface collecting. So <laughs> Cleaning was simple. Soak them in a bucket, hit them with a scrub brush, then a toothbrush to try to find things on the slabs. And I also learned to use a splatter shield. I had some really wet pants before I figured that one out. <laughs> And uh, when you got done, if you were lucky, you had, you know, just one e-grail or whatever on the slab. Sometimes a lot of them. Our, uh, our early collecting, our first collecting, when you pull a slab out, it's got kind of, you know, muddy stuff all over it. And we kind of feel around on the wrap mosquito on there to see if we felt a, 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 an e-grail. If we did, we'd keep it. If we didn't, we'd pitch it back in the hole and bury it with the rest of the stuff. Well, when we washed the stuff, we found out there was a whole bunch more e-drills on those slabs than we were feeling with our fingers. So then we started taking everything out and cleaning it later. And Dan will probably appreciate this little structure right here, a little mm -hmm. what it looks like. We'll, uh, we'll talk about that later, too. 